The seven most irritating character types in D&D. The curse of the problem player. That guy you don't want in your game. Worst player stereotypes in D&D. We like to focus on the person, but sometimes it's the game that's to blame too. Played a certain way, the mechanics support behaviour that's neither big nor clever and can only be used to annoy. If you're creating a new character, here's some pitfalls you might want to avoid, and if you're a DM, some things to look out for. I present to you my list of the seven most irritating character types in 5th edition D&D. Number 1. The Oxymoron The Oxymoron is a walking contradiction, a player that doesn't make any sense for the setting, tone or theme of the adventure, even if they follow all of the rules for character creation. Examples include the Drow Cleric of Light, a Triton Sailor in a desert setting, or the High Crit Polearm Fighter in your gritty courtly intrigue game. Nice spear, Ambassador Toffington. Tell me more about the trade negotiations with the southern provinces. This character type is most often fielded by the new player, or one that missed the pitch for the sort of game you were going for. Backstory, or the lack of it, can also be a sticking point for the oxymoron. If you can't explain how your character got here, don't expect anyone else to make sense of it either. 5e's backgrounds are what your character was doing before now. So, can you really be a folk hero at level 1? So, it says you used to be a folk hero, but then gave it all up to become an adventurer. In time, stories were told of your heroic exploits far and wide, and you became something of a folk hero. Oh, the cycle continues? How do you fix it if you're the DM? Don't. They made a character they wanted to play, and might not think the rest was important. That's fine. It might seem a bit weird and out of place, but you're playing a game, not writing fiction. Nothing's really set in stone. One bad roll can change everything. If one character obviously doesn't match the rest, either flat out ignore it and move on, or grab hold of that thistle and use it as part of your adventure. Introduce a reason for that character to be in the world. Maybe they're the last of their kind, or came here from somewhere else. Perhaps they're rare where the campaign is now, but over on the next continent, they're more common, and it's the rest of the party that's treated as strange and different. Just why is a halfling thief travelling with a band of exiled dwarves? Maybe he used to be a dwarf before he took an arrow to the beard? Uh, moving on. Number two, the Lone Ranger. The Lone Ranger is keen to engage and take part in every aspect of the game, but just because you could do something doesn't mean you should every single time. Ironically, the Lone Ranger playstyle is most often adopted by an optimizer who, rather than focusing on specialising, falls into the trap of spreading themselves out to cover all the different roles in the party, but ends up becoming a party of one. The Lone Ranger is available in two distinct flavours. The Loner role plays as a self-reliant character that wants and needs no one. In the extreme, they isolate themselves from the rest of the party, despite D&D being at heart a cooperative game. Usually, they feel that that makes their character mysterious and edgy. Okay, we'll go to the haunted mine. What about you, Dan? I brood silently in the corner and say nothing. Uh, so that's a yes then? Let's go, everyone. I wait until they leave and meet my criminal contact at the docks. Um, what? I've already been to the mine. It was in my 30-page backstory. Didn't you read it? 5th edition has many mechanics that mean you don't need another character to be effective or can easily avoid situations where you would. Touch spells can be aimed at the caster, carry weights are generous, stealth, knock and enhance ability are there to change the conditions in the single player's favour so that they can bypass obstacles meant to challenge a group. Action surge, haste, animal companions and summoned creatures bump up the action economy of one character, making them the equivalent of two or three. In my experience, languages and tool proficiencies are rarely deployed in most games, as well as some skills. Honestly, how often do you make a performance check? But I'm Batman. Ugh, don't be a loner. The other variant is the I'll Do It Ranger, a player that wants to be involved all the time, but unwittingly becomes a one-man army. Mechanically, some classes and combinations have a broad reach. I can tank, I can buff, I can heal, I can fight, I can... Yeah, you see that door? Of course, I have a high perception. Then walk through it and wait in the kitchen, while the rest of us play the game. If you roll for stats, the player might just have higher numbers than everyone else, in which case, rules-wise, they're much more likely to succeed. Try and catch this during character creation. If they don't, the player just may have a more dominant personality at the table than the rest of the players. This build is normally some combination of paladin, bard or ranger rogue. You could even be a pure druid or wizard at higher levels. How do I patch this one? Split the party in two every so often, to give the other characters time to shine and give the ranger, with their widespread, 
a number of tasks they need to do at the same time, so they have to cooperate. Why not have a boss monster challenge them to single combat to keep them occupied? Put in puzzles or checks that require player knowledge instead of in-game clout. Do more social interactions where the character's words are more important than the mechanics. Provide more opportunities for other players to focus their skills. If you have to, use creature reactions to interrupt the player and push the spotlight onto others. Just don't go so far as to single them out as a problem. You're running a game for a group, not one. Talk to the player and encourage their character to use the help action and to occasionally sit back to give others a chance to take a turn. The loner variant is only really suitable for solo D&D. Remind them it is a team sport. If they want their character to be all moody and socially awkward, that's fine. But most of us are that already. We don't need to double up on it with roleplay. If you need to take a nuclear option, just give them disadvantage on all charisma checks until they get the point. Number 3. The Flip Flopper Also known as the Fidget Spinner, if you only communicate in fads, this sufferer of D&D ADHD starts off as an enthusiastic and engaged player, but quickly becomes bored or apathetic with their abilities, spells or backstory in play. We all make mistakes with our characters. We put our stats slightly in the wrong place and abandon our goals after one session if they're just not as fun in practice as we thought they would be on paper. The flip-flopper takes this one step further. They may get character envy, comparing their performance with others at the table, <coughs> usually against a specialist build, optimised to do one thing really well. They might have seen a cool build online they think would be better than theirs, or just go a few sessions with bad roles, which make them think that their character sucks. The flip-flopper solution is multi-classing their way to new and interesting mechanics. They often take seemingly random feats that don't make any sense for their character to have logically. You might also see them staring intently at their XP value, hoping it will magically go up so they can gain a level and tinker some more. I've never seen this in play, but you do hear stories of flip-floppers trying to actively get their character killed so they can start again with some of that new hotness. This is obviously a pain in the bum to the rest of the party, and can be annoying for the DM, as they struggle to weave the story and world around the ever-changing player and his Technicolor Dreamcoat. Solutions? Give everyone a mulligan after the first game. Let the players reset their character if they want, to make sure they're engaged and happy to continue with the story. Too late for that, mate. Alright then, focus on involving the character without leaning all over the mechanics. Use investigations and puzzles. Use enemies and opportunities for them to shine with what they already have. Give them quests and downtime projects they can work on, like taking charge of a home base, or maybe a follower they can tinker with, like a squire or an apprentice. Scrolls and magic items can allow them to do different things without having to change their class. Also remember, when you gain a level, in most classes you can swap out one spell you already have with one at the same level, to mix things up. If all your players like to do this one, run more one-off adventures that let them rotate characters around. Number 4. The DM's Bane Wanting nothing better than to get the last word, the DM's Bane is built to take advantage of the mechanics to stitch you up. They're not interested in affecting your story, just the outcome of anything that's left up to chance. There are a number of ways that this can be done. In order of severity, taking extra actions, getting re-rolls, gaining advantage, granting disadvantage to the DM, status effects, modifier increases, <coughs> plus one, modifier decreases, extra rests, and extra resources. Honourable mention should also be given to subverting or evading encounters entirely, but this could either be manipulating the rules or pure honest lateral thinking. I'll leave that one for you to decide. An example of a DM's bane supported by the mechanics is a halfling diviner with the lucky feet and the racial feet from Xanathar's. They multi-class into fiend-packed warlock, use blur, bane, bless, enhance ability, etc. and really, really want to keep going to high levels to get wish, because f*** you, that's why. Alternatively, more of a martial <coughs> munchkin <coughs> build would include maxed out decks, 5th edition's god stat, con, proficiencies in all the good saves, not you intelligence, nobody loves you, feet bloat that makes gout look anorexic, and really high AC, resistances, and a bag of HP. This usually comes up if the character is more optimised than the others, and the player is more experienced with 5e than the DM and everyone else. Solutions? Well, now that you know the types of effects that characters can do to change your roles, you can prepare for them. These things were put into the game. Be flexible enough to adapt your story on the fly. It may be tempting to jack up the encounters to keep up with that player, but it'll only make things tougher for the others and encourages a DM versus player mentality. You're better off staying off the mechanics, or just letting them do it until they burn through all their resources. Just don't give them a rest to get things back. Remember, you don't always need to make a roll. You can always get rid of feats, okay, just lucky, just, just lucky, or multi-classing in your game entirely, if you really have to. After all, they are optional rules. Number five, the spammer. 
The spammer, or the one-trick pony, is almost the antithesis of a playstyle. I'm the best there is of what I do, but what I do is incredibly boring. Think the Eldritch Blast Gatling Gun, the Half-Orc Barbarian that always uses Intimidate, and the Heelbot Cleric. There are three main types of spammer. Analysis Paralysis is a character build with too many options. The player is not sure what to use, particularly at high levels. They can also be a new player that doesn't know any better or isn't confident about how D&D works and sticks rigidly with their character sheet abilities or a mechanic they feel they've worked out. If you've just learned how to make a ranged attack with your bow, you're more likely to repeat the same action so you don't have to ask everyone else and slow the game down. Captain Combo this master strategist thinks they've solved D&D with a killer combo and that becomes their go-to choice. Perhaps they're abusing items or loopholes, charm effects, wishes, whatever. In card and board games it's called dominant strategy and can be particularly devastating. But in war games and RPGs, the other players and DM have much more ability to adapt and change tactics to counter spam. It doesn't take a rules errata or a new addition to nerf an OP combo in a storytelling game. The third musketeer is the drinking bird. They're either shy or having a bad day, but this player isn't really interested in what's going on in the game, doesn't feel they can contribute in a meaningful way, or is just tired, so repeats the same actions like a broken record, over and over. They could have too few options. Some classes don't have much in the way of reactions and bonus actions to choose from. When we only had the core player's handbook, some options were just better than others. The Totem Barbarian, the Hexing Warlock and the Hunter Ranger come to mind. No one wants to deliberately suck at something that they do for fun, so those were the options chosen, more often than not. This is more of a short term irritation and usually goes away by the next session. A bit like spots. Ok, ok, so how do you sort the spam from the not so spam? Players can ready actions, use the help action, whip out their equipment, interact with the environment or even step back and let one of the other members of the party take the spotlight for a while. For DMs, have your players take breaks and change to a different pillar of play, like exploration, when things stop being fun. This should fix our first and last types of spammer. If you're up against a resolute captain combo, letting their combo work sometimes can be a reward for their choice of build, but you don't have to let it work all the time. Decide how to neutralise or prepare against it in a few different ways between sessions to keep things interesting for the party. I would still recommend checking that what they've been trying to do works within the rule set. Does it need concentration or components? What's the casting time? Do they need line of sight or to declare their action first? Have they stacked two things that they're not allowed to by rules as written, like extra attacks from two different classes? 5e is more resilient to combos and ability stacking than older editions, but there are some out there. You might need to restrict character creation, spells and feats to certain books if your player just can't help themselves. As new books come out, there's more risk of power creep and odd combinations coming together to give an unfair advantage. You can always draw the player away from spamming with a big carrot. Random magic items that give the character a different option or flavour, like ones of healing, a figurine of wondrous power, or everyone's favourite, the immovable rod. Number 6. The Hoarder Also known as the Magpie or the Walking Junkyard, the Hoarder has clearly been playing too much Welder Trolls or Weablo and doesn't know imaginary theft is still annoying. It's not always the rogue who's nicking everything that's not been nailed down. That's class profiling, that is. The character may have a high stealth, sleight of hand and deception. They might be proficient with thieves tools, have a suspicious amount of pockets and the bonus of cunning actions behind their roguish smile. But that does not make them a hoarder. Shame on you. Here, where did my watch go? What's that in your pockets? Oi, come back here you thieving beggar. Your hoarder could easily just be a fighter that takes advantage of their high strength score or powerful build to walk about with half a village blacksmiths on their back. They might be that kind of necromancer. Why did you keep 13 centaur testicles? No, don't tell me it's one of your goals. Ugh. They could also be abusing the hell out of feats like two weapon fighting, warcaster and crossbow expert to juggle a weapon on every finger and rattle out arrows like they're allergic to them. Hoarders breed hoarders. The other players will often copy the hoarder and start competing over treasure if there are no consequences for their actions. And this can be very self-destructive to your game. If you'll find yourself hoarding, be aware that this can really mess things up and slow down the story as you pick every room clean. This is an easy one to sort out if you're a DM. Players can only find things if you say they're there. As a DM you have full control of what they do or don't find. Sometimes cutting off the water can seem harsh, but here's five other suggestions that keep the game fun and don't beat the hoarder and the rest of the party over the head too much. Plan A. Older editions would use gold for XP as a measure of successful adventurers, but finding the gold wasn't the problem, getting it home was. 
use time constraints in dungeons, or just sheer bulk to stop hoarders. If it won't fit through the door, you'll have to chop it up, isn't very appealing if the room is quickly filling with snake swarms. Give them less time in town before there's an encounter, so they don't have the chance to strip search every house down to the brickwork. Plan B, follow stricter resource rules. D&D does have encumbrance rules on page 176 of the player's handbook. You could also have them do skill checks using their tool proficiencies to cut up, pry loose or free objects without them ending up being worthless. D&D's carrying rules can be a bit clunky, so you can always borrow from other RPGs. Some have a hard cap of like 20 items that you can have with you at any time, and only one of them can be bulky. Others do away with recording mundane items altogether. It's assumed you always have access to mundane items, so there's no reason to care about them in-game. Plan C. Keep them frugal. Use rewards with no intrinsic monetary or mechanical value. Boons, plots of land and the respect of powerful NPCs. Have fewer treasure drops, including permanent items. Give them things that are only single use, and encourage them to use them. Unlike earlier editions, it isn't assumed your character will have one magic item per slot by the time they get to about level 10. The proficiency bonus goes up as you increase in level in 5th edition, so you can still be effective without having anything. Characters can only attune to three magical items at once, so don't feel the need to give out the premium stuff like it's Skittles. Make them quest for it. You can always distribute specific items to specific party members if your hoarder is also grabby. Some iconic D&D items and spells promote collecting tat. Bag of Holding, Haywood's Handy Haversack, What's His Name's Secret Chest. If you're worried that they'll stow more stuff than Mary Poppins' carpet bag or Batman's utility belt, just avoid giving these out. Another point to consider is that if you give them good value for items they <coughs> find on the side of the road and they do sell them, they'll quickly amass an enormous amount of gold compared to the rest of the party, and they have little to spend it on in 5e. Weirdly, if you give them bad prices, it won't actually stop them nicking stuff, and now they have no incentive to get rid of it. They'll cut around every last bucket, goblet, and loincloth. Plan D. Cover everything in magic smart water, and catch them out whenever they try and fence the goods. Send out hunters to find treasures your hoarder has pinched, and make NPCs in the town more and more suspicious as time goes on. Come up with the consequences of thievery in a civilised and not so civilised world full of magic and strange creatures. Do the guards follow them around? Are they searched on entering town? Are wanted posters put up? Do richer NPCs have magic alarms, tougher locks and traps laid for potential robbers? Maybe you can even increase the level of heat in the region for every important item swiped. If none of these work, there's always plan E. Have an NPC steal all of it back, lose it in a shipwreck offshore or have things consumed to power a magic spell required to progress the story. Does anyone have five soiled guard uniforms, an old ladle, an eyeball from an evil god, and a four foot length of velvet curtain? You need them to complete this ritual. I have those. Four foot exactly. That's lucky. Yes. Yes it is. Well done. Number seven. The Angel of Death. The little sister to the hoarder who nicks everything, the Angel of Death solves all their problems by killing everything. Most players that adopt this character type are derided as power gamers or murder hobos, but in earlier editions this was the most effective way to play to get all that sweet loot and levels. Combat is still core to D&D, and damage also remains the main metric by which spells and classes are measured. Why take this spell when this one does more damage for the same cost? Which combination does the most damage per round? This assassin type character is always optimised for massive damage! Because the bigger the number, the more killing that can be done. And after all, dead is the best status condition. The paladin assassin that smites on top of sneak attack, the raging extra attacking fighter barbarian, and the glass cannon Mr. Blasty Wizard all suffer from this affliction. If you're exclusively into damage dealing, your characters will often be less well-rounded and flexible when met with other challenges. Generally, in my experience, this takes the form of crap mental stats, a narrow range of skills, and indifference to the social and exploration parts of the game. This is also less interesting for the other players to watch. After all, how many fighty combat-focused builds are there in the Wizards livestream games? How many Battlemaster fighters and barbarians have been played? They put the attention on roleplay, because watching someone else roll loads of dice isn't that fun, and they're exclusively using theatre of the mind over tactical combat. Unless you're playing an order of assassins or highwaymen, the huge body count being left in the adventurer's wake can ruin the realism of the game. Like the Horder, it encourages the other players to take things less seriously, and to join in on the murderous rampage if there are no consequences for their actions, or inaction, at stopping their friend. The chaotic alignment excuse doesn't hold much water here. Killing defenceless prisoners or witnesses quickly casts your hero as the villain, and shows a total disregard for the DM, the setting and tone of the game, or the alignment of the character and their party. If you want to play the Slayer-type character, that's okay, but give yourself some utility as well 
so you can join in when it's not combat. Don't go looking for fights, you don't have to kill everything. And certainly don't expect your DM to reward you with XP if you do. If you're a DM for this type of character, let them know immediately if they've gone too far, and discourage excessive violence for the sake of it. There's a couple of things you can do to sate their thirst for blood without turning everywhere on the map into a massacre or a ghost town. Try and provide the player with an outlet for their character to shine, but give a reason for the fighting to stop without it always ending in a serial killing. Two classic solutions are the NPC having vital information or is innocent but is being controlled by someone else. Make monsters stronger with resistances and immunities and have them use surprise and tactics to give them more of a chance. They could draw the notice of more powerful villains or gods than they were ready to face, but don't skew things too much against the rest of the players who might not be as good at combat. Make sure to have robust consequences ready if it all gets too much. Use bounty hunters, rivals or counter assassins, perhaps the city guard and traps and alarms to discourage an anything goes approach when the player is in a civilised area. Make hiding the bodies a challenge. Perhaps the other NPCs are suspicious of the strangers being in town when there's a violent death. Maybe there's a necromancer hoovering up all the bodies in the party's wake and turning them into a horde of zombies that they will have to face down the line, and these corpses have been taking names. If your party are playing the heroes, it's not just the paladin that has to atone. Other RPGs have corruption rules that affect the character's appearance or abilities. Have them scarred emotionally or physically by their actions. Right, that's your lot. My seven most irritating character types. Taken to extremes, any of these types can really annoy the rest of the players at the table. But if you can dial back a bit and your DM has a way to manage these types of characters, there's no reason for them to be game breaking. If you're a DM, remember your players can easily stumble into most of these by accident, as they're often reinforced by the mechanics of the game. They're not all out to wreck your game or irritate your socks off. People play their characters in different ways. As long as you're having fun and not spoiling anyone else's, you have my permission to do whatever the hell you like. Within reason. Uh, legally? No. No, not that. Uh, okay. Edit that last bit out. Have any of these character types been in your game? Did I miss one you find really annoying? Let me know downstairs. Thanks for watching. Take a rummage in my description box for more content on this topic and subscribe to get more plus one wisdom. See you next time.